Ito. We're not seeing you, we're not seeing the participants, but it's great to know that you're there, colleagues, and thank you for saying hi. 115, it's 902, a couple of more minutes, maybe one more minutes as people join, and, and then we begin. Hey, colleagues from Mexico. It is indeed the World Association. Nice to see everyone across continents. In different time, it is late night in Malaysia, from which Wayu will be presenting. And it's early morning in, in the United States. And hello, Wisconsin. Appreciate everyone joining at different times. Uh, okay, girls, I think we, we, we may as well begin uh, 122 participants by this time and hopefully uh, others will join as we're starting. So our, top, uh, our, our topic for today is COVID-19, how we ask questions, how we collect the data and what we do to learn. Our webinar today mm -hmm. fe features participants for four countries for four continents. There will be Constanza Silly from Argentina, Gary Langer from the United States, Wayusito from Malaysia, and Torbjorn Sjöström from Sweden. We will discuss the questions that directly relate to how we started the pandemics. What aspects of public food uh, colleagues measures, measure in different parts of the world? How do they collect data in this time when the usual field operations have been majorly disrupted? What are the new challenges, how they cope with them? What are the most interesting findings that they uh, get from our research? And what has changed at public moods? Uh, what insight we have to try to look in the future? What change we anticipate to come in, 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 the, in the future? Uh, our first presenter will be Constanza Silly. Constanza Silly is from Argentina. She is an executive director of Voices and she has 20 years of experience in public opinion and research. Voices have been providing consulting and research services in Argentina and Latin America region since 2012. Uh, I'm given to the floor to Constanza, and while she's preparing her slides, I wanted to give a few short notices. First, uh, the order of our presenters will be as follows. Everyone will have 12 minutes to present. And every listener is invited to ask the questions in, in the chat. You can see the chat on the right-hand side. Please write your questions there. And when, after all, all the presenters have finished, we'll ask the questions uh, to those participants uh, you direct them to. Okay? So I'm, stop share, I'm stopping sharing my screen. Constanza, the floor is yours. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Constanza Sile. I'm executive director of Voice in, in Argentina. And the aim of this presentation is to give you a snapshot of the COVID situation in my country and specifically how we are at Voices working in order to fulfill our commitment of bringing the voice of the people to leaders so that they can make better and informed decisions. Uh, first, some facts about COVID in Argentina. Uh, till yesterday, we had uh, uh, 569 deaths. Here, what we've seen is the data of deaths in relation to population. In our region, as you probably know, US appears as the most damaged country in terms of death by population, followed by Brazil and Peru. 
In Argentina, we are among the, the lowest, especially if we consider that Uruguay and Paraguay are countries with a lot less of international traffic. Our first case was diagnosed early March, and two weeks later, watching what was happening in some countries in Europe, namely Spain and Italy, which are two countries that are very close culturally to us, a very strict lockdown was established, although we had very few cases. As I said, lockdown is very strict. We can only go out for groceries and basic stuff, and kids were not allowed to go even uh, to take a walk. Uh, now they can, but only an hour per week. So really very strict and really long. We are in day 67, 66 of strict coercive lockdown. Um, Argentina is a country where more than 35% of people live in poverty. Some private measures say poverty in our country is nearly 40%, and this is growing. It is also important to know that 3 million people here in my country live in shanty towns, assinated with no regular water or light or regular gas connection, and usually surrounded by garbage. So measures such as lockdown and washing of hands are, if not impossible, really difficult to handle in these situations in Shantytown. Government has decided to close some Shantytowns. People can go out of the Shantytown uh, with the aid of the police. And this uh, is uh, being considered uh, by some a controversial uh, measure. So this is our goal. Now, what we have measured since the, since the start of COVID, we have conducted 10 studies on different topics. Here, uh, I will show some examples of what we have measured. COVID and society, fear of COVID affecting the health, approval of government and other relevant actors, social relations during lockdown, the lockdown and restrictive measures, approval, difficulties, changes in hygiene habits, changes in consumption habits, a variety of consumption habits, but for example, what is happening with mate, this is a mate, Literally all Argentinians drink mate, which is a sort of infusion served in a pot like this, but it's a mainly shared consumption. I drink and I pass it over to the next person. So it is interesting to understand if people have changed this habit, how and what is the future of this consumption. Also homeschooling, also pets. In relation to the uh, COVID and the economy, the personal impact, expected impact in the future, how it will impact Argentina compared to other countries, how it will impact our country compared to our biggest crisis, which is the crisis of 2001, the role of companies, etc. Regarding mental health, mood in one word, in a scale of one to 10, incidence in, 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 in stress, depression, in anxiety, in loneliness, in problems to sleep, in consumption of psychoactive products, in life satisfaction, and in the assessment of the own health, as an example of what we have measured in COVID and mental health. And then the future, no? Made it timing for the end of COVID. When will the future begin? Is something that we ask respondents in Argentina. And expected changes post pandemic in different personal and society levels. Regarding the methodologies we used, uh, we used a, a, a poll, all online, group, and interviews also online via panels and recruiting in social media, telephone and emailing. We use all this in ordinary life, but uh, we use face-to-face -face in the region when seeking for national representative samples. Uh, so this, is, this implies a change. Also, it's key in this type of situations 
to be able to do international research, to be able to give results a context. And we have done two studies of approximately 20 countries together with the network of WIN and DAA, which added a lot of value to our understanding. There are a variety of challenges. Methodological challenges include the adaptation of methodologies. As I said, this is a region where face-to-face -face is the most representative method, not losing comparability. We here in Argentina have public opinion data collected by us since the early 80s, and it's important to be able to track those changes and mastering mixed mode. There are also some operational challenges, such as speed, timing, uh, the situation is dynamic and timing is more key than ever. In international research, the speed and the changes in methodology add complexity and also funding. No? Funding is a big challenge. In terms of economic constraint, it's an issue. All are interested in understanding, in planning the future, but very few are ready to pay. Still, uh, fortunately, here in Argentina, we work with institutions such as universities, whether university or the International American Development Bank or some uh, chambers or association of business that we have been able to fund our research and we have also done research on our own. There are also strategic challenges the contingency and the future, how can we conduct systematic research that can be consulted for immediate action, leaders need to make decisions, but that can be also served for more deep analysis and understanding of changes in the future. And last, I would like to share some interesting findings. We included here just a few, and I, and I will talk of only some, but you can have access to a presentation or contact us if you need more information on some of these topics. Well, first of all, always, but it was very clear during the COVID situation, the power of quality research to get a deeper understanding of what is happening in our population, in our homes. For instance, conducting well, we got a sense of how adults feel the moment, and they feel it as that of an assessment and review of their whole lives. This idea of closeness to death. One participant told us, very illustrative, it's like when you die and your life passes before you. And also, uh, thanks to Qual, we understood something that we had not foreseen before, that is the desire of young people of a high or middle high a social economic level to start traveling again immediately after this ends. No, we had not imagined this. And this was a confirmed some weeks after when we saw a, a, the news that, that the many tickets had been bought and they had been bought by young people. So very interesting one. Then regarding COVID and society, what we can say is that here in Argentina, there is a tremendous fear of being personally infected by COVID or having a family member infected. More even in other countries where objectively it is struck more. Also, the idea of pets, uh, which we have a lot of experience, we saw that it has helped bear the lockdown a lot. Also, the technology helps, but our Latino culture means that people are missing a lot, not only seeing relatives and friends, but touching them, kissing them, hugging them. That the issue of time, which at first appears that people believe that now they had a lot of time, what we are seeing is that uh, the new routines take up a lot of time, and so time is, is, is continues to be scarce as in normal life. Regarding the economy, tremendous majority of people here have been affected, and there is a tremendous fear, this is the worst fear post-COVID, what will happen with the economy. 
Regarding mental health, the population is highly pessimistic, the worst is yet to come, and there has been a strong, this we have trend, strong impact in stress, depression, in sleeping disorders, in consumption of alcohol and tobacco. All negative mental states have increased. Young people express more difficulty to bear the lockdown, and we also see more impact of COVID in mental health among the poor, which is really very worrying. And last, regarding the future, we know it is difficult to forecast. There are no benchmarks. There are some expected changes in hygiene habits, e-commerce, remote work, but mainly future is uncertain and only time and research will allow us to see and explain it better. What we see is Argentinians want to get back to the normal life and what worries them the most is economic problems and urgency. So, well, that was all. Hope uh, it helped. Thank you, Constanza. Uh, perfect timing, fantastic presentation. Uh, there are questions appearing to you there in the chat called questions and answers. I will ask everyone to post maybe questions in the main chat so everyone will see them easier. And we have 166 participants at the moment. Hello, everyone. And our next presenter uh, is Gary Langer from the United States. He is a founder and the president from, of Langer Research Associate, a market and social research company that conducts service in the United States and internationally. Gary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yulia. Sharing my screen. So thanks everyone for joining the call and giving us your time today. Uh, thanks Constanza for that interesting presentation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the Sean COVID-19 survey archive. Uh, we conduct uh, uh, surveys, we just put out a survey here in the United States for uh, ABC News and the Washington Post on attitudes and experiences of COVID-19 and its potential impact in the United States on our presidential election coming up in the fall. Uh, a lot of us are doing really important and valuable research into this uh, uh, extraordinary event in world history. Uh, the question that came to us is how do we get our arms around all this great research? Uh, there's so much of it being done in so many corners of the world. Uh, it can be a little overwhelming to try to, to really get a good sense of what's out there and how we can uh, use and learn from it. Uh, hence this archive. So what is Sean? It's a Societal Experts Action Network. This is a, a, a panel uh, convened by the National Academies of, of Sciences in, in, in Washington uh, in collaboration with the National Science Foundation. It's got two missions. One is to connect policymakers with critical social, behavioral, and economic research into the pandemic. The other is to share this research with a broader audience, including the research community, the news media, and the public at large. And that's where we come in with the Sean Archive. The idea of the archive we set up is to leverage transparency for the public good, to have the producers and sponsors of these important surveys on the pandemic uh, set aside their competitive interests and share their knowledge uh, with others worldwide in a one-stop shop, if you will, for this essential research. Uh, we've created an open access, easy to use resource. So you can search and retrieve individual survey questions, but we wanna go deeper than that. We're available, we have uh, analytical reports, cross tabulated uh, tables of data, data sets, scripted questionnaires essential for replication, uh, methodological disclosure and more. The current connection, uh, collection has more than 225 studies from more than 25 nations more than 75 data sets, more than 2,500 questions. It's housed on our knowledge management platform called PARC, uh, which is a, a platform for survey research uh, firms and their, and their audiences. To support inference, what we're collecting in the archive is probability-based samples. Uh, we do so mindful of the report of the task force on online panels of APOR and, and other sources, uh, suggesting that non-probability panels uh, don't or reliably estimate population values and uh, don't operate under a theoretical basis to claim representativeness. Uh, this work is so important. We want to inform policymakers, researchers, and the public 
with uh, data that we reasonably can have confidence in, in terms of its validity and reliability. Therefore, we're using probability-based samples. The benefits of the system are that users can locate this research on precise topics of interest with all supporting materials right next door. Policymakers can assess the latest data, uh, understand the public's policy preferences, responses to initiatives and their personal experiences, and calibrate their next steps accordingly. The research community can learn from this knowledge base as it's developed in real time, assess the strength of research claims, and look to replicate and extend key findings. And the media and the public can stay well informed. And we also ultimately hope that this archive will help support the historical record uh, in these challenging and difficult times. Our first question is, will survey producers and sponsors set aside the competitive interests I mentioned and contribute freely to, the, to this database, to the shared knowledge base? And the answer has been resoundingly yes. This list shows some, not all, uh, we, we get new ones every week, uh, organizations that are participating right up to the full data set level. And the provision of raw data sets allows the, really the most full secondary analysis possible. And all these other producers around the world are contributing their research materials to the archive. Again, the collection also is growing every day. Since we're dealing with this uh, data to make it uh, available uh, in our open access archive, uh, we're watching it all go by and therefore we're writing weekly summaries uh, of key results uh, of surveys released in the previous week. This is just one example of the typical topics that we include in any weekly summary. Kind of looks like this, <clears throat> but often goes on six, eight or 10 pages, depending on how much material has been released in the previous week. It's a very handy summary of all this great research and you can sign up at the link below to receive them if you'd like to. With that, I'd like to go take a look, to show you how the archive operates. You can see the URL covid-19.park.us.com. You can sign up here for the summaries I mentioned. We can just go to search. Let's say we want to know if people are wearing masks. And under uh, keyword- Gary, you're showing your presentation, not the archive. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see if we can quit the presentation. And just a moment. Gary, you will have to share your other screen. All right, here we go. We have it now? Yeah. Yes. Fantastic, thank you. So you can sign up here. I'm gonna to go to the search page. Let's say we wanna know if, um, about masks or people using wearing masks. We can type the word mask. We're searching top lines read search. And we get every question that's been asked with the word mask in it. As you can see, there's 47 of them. When you're leaving your home, are you wearing a mask? Then we can see our results. Single click away, we have all the associated materials that this data producer has provided or shared with us. Now, if we ask the word mask, we may not capture the word masks, plural or other related terms using an asterisk will let us expand our search now we can see there's 67 questions to have asked masks or mask or others. And again, we can search through, look at each one, see the results to the question and see the related question materials. Now, 67 questions can be a lot to look at. Another option is to hit project only. Instead of seeing every question with the word mask in it, we see every project that has a mask question in it with the metadata associated with the project and again, we can jump in and see the related materials. Now, that's a search of top lines. Top line by top line, we mean the question and the overall results. We can also search questionnaires. Let's try another word. Say we wanna know about stress that people may be experiencing. You find 11 questions with the word stress in it. And we can click and see, in this case, now we're looking at the scripted questionnaire. We see the coding the instructs, if yes, do not read, the volunteered responses, all the things we need that if we ever want to uh, replicate this question, we can do so precisely by matching the coding and the instructs to make sure that we have comparable data. And we can say, okay, I'm gonna repeat this question. I'm gonna repeat this question, export them, bring them forward into a new document, collect any other questions we want, add any new questions and send it off for programming. 
And we've ensured in this case that when we re-ask this question to validate or extend the research, that we've done so quite precisely and we can be confident therefore that our results are, are indeed comparable. Now, where did this come from? We can click on the full document. And it's the full questionnaire that Kaiser Family Foundation, in this case, put in the field. We can scroll down. And our system will pull out the individual questions and present them in parsed fashion, as you just saw. We can scroll down and see each question they asked. Well, here's one about decisions in the election. Let's say we're interested in knowing more about that question. We can search for decision and election typing. Let's say we want to see the top line result there. And there's that very question with the results to it and with the source materials a click away. We can additionally uh, search analyses. An analysis is any word, Excel text, PDF or PowerPoint document. Let's go back to the word stress. Here's a report and we know that it has the word stress in it. So analytical materials, documentation, others. I want to search other uh, document types. These can be ones that are not necessarily, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, text-based. Does so for example, .sav is an SPSS data set and we can see all the data sets that we have in the system. There's other functionality as well. The key point, I think, particularly for the Waypore audience, is that we can search in uh, for a variety of nations and a variety of languages. If I look at advanced search here, we can see we can search only the US collection or if we prefer only the international collection. We can use the notes mode to find questions from any particular country. Do we have any studies from Japan? Sure enough, there they are. We wanna see the projects only. And there they are. Torborn is with us from Sweden. We can see studies from Sweden, and we do. Have we any studies from Malaysia? And we do. And indeed, Park will search in, in uh, any of 52 languages. So if I put here the word menos, a Spanish word, <clears throat> maybe I'll turn project only off. And we can see here's a question. <clears throat> Comes up, a number of questions come up in Spanish with the Spanish word we're searching on. Yag, Swedish word. And there's the word Yag, et cetera. We can search, as I say, in any of 52 languages and look at this international collection. We have studies, as I mentioned, from more than 25 individual countries. If you wanna see what others are asking, wanna in creating your own questionnaire and form your judgment, about what's been asked previously and move that knowledge forward. That's the purpose of this archive. I appreciate your time listening. I'm happy to answer any questions either on the chat or I can always be reached at glanger at langerresearch.com. And I'll turn it back to Yulia. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, people keep joining us. We have 175 participants and there are questions appearing. There are three questions to Constanza. Uh, someone keeps typing questions. I invite everyone to continue to do so. And our next speaker is from the opposite part of the world, uh, from Malaysia. It's 9.30 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur right now. And our speaker is Yu Sito, who is a chief operating officer in Central Forest in Malaysian Poland Agency with a headquarter in Kuala Lumpur. It also has been doing some surveys internationally and why you, the floor is yours. Thanks, Julia. Let me just get my screen shared. Sorry. Okay, is, um, do you see my screen? Yes. 
So, um, good morning, everyone, I guess. Um, good night or good evening to the ones from Asia. Uh, my name is Wayu. I'm the COO of Central Force Malaysia. Um, I'm also part of the executive committee of the Marketing Research Society in Malaysia as well. Um, a bit, a little bit about Central Force. We are a market, well, market insights company founded over 23 years ago. Um, it's been quite a while. We conduct our own data collection um, and we have strong expertise in CATI, telephone interviews. We have a CATI facility that can take up to 80 physical interviewers and we can accommodate up to 150 remotely. And um, we've also done um, quite a bit of opinion polling as well um, for the likes of Gallup, Field Research Center, and even the State Department um, from the States. And um, we also do a wide variety of research through different industries and segments. A little bit about the data that we have or that we collected. Um, it's actually part of the Gallup International Association COVID-19 snap poll series. Um, there were 17 countries that took part in it. And all in all, over, over 17 countries, we have done about 17,800 interviews um, in total. Across the parameter in the boxes on the right, you will see the Southeast Asian countries that took part of it. And um, yeah, so here in Malaysia, um, it was done during the lockdown, during mid of April. Um, we did it through CATI remotely over four days. 755 Malaysians were interviewed um, and we did it uh, fully random and it was a nationwide coverage with 18 plus adults. We also did a write up, it's featured on Thai Inquirer. Maybe later on when Yulia pass out the slides to everyone, you can just click on it to have a read. Okay, so I just wanna bring you through um, the Malaysian perspective from uh, on the COVID-19 situation. Um, I'll start off with Malaysia. I'll move on a little bit for, to the Southeast Asians perspective, and then a little bit more on the Asian perspective on it. So what makes Malaysia different? Um, What's unique about us is that when we started off, there was a little bit of political tension um, during the period of February to March between two parties, um, one of which some of you may know of the historic turnover um, where our ex-Prime Minister has just took over the, uh, the government party for 50 years. And he just abruptly stepped down, which caused a lot of confusion. The transition was very unplanned for and people were just lost and confused. And some of them in denial as well. In the midst of all these, there was the insurgence of the COVID-19 pandemic and it placed our country on lockdown. Um, if you look at the waves there, it's across five waves. Um, we are all going to open the lockdown soon, hopefully. <laughs> and um, the two bars over there is when we did our COVID-19 surveys. But what I want to highlight to you here is that um, even though all of you, most of you have gone through lockdown, I want to highlight the effects of the lockdown in Malaysia. Primarily here, um, over here you will see Malaysia and you see a few other first world countries, um, Italy, USA and Germany. And um, the question here we asked the, the respondents was, have you lost your job, work part time, temporarily stopped working or was a serious part of your income, you know, um, lost? If you compare Malaysia with the other countries and even the world's average, you can see that Malaysia was significantly higher in all of the factors. And um, one of the reasons why we think it was this way um, was because Malaysia has a very strong dependency on China. China is our largest trading partner, in case you didn't know. And with China having the pandemic first ahead of everyone, that caused a lot of suffering, a lot of business to collapse and you know um, take a huge hit in Malaysia. Paired along with the lockdown and a lot of businesses just couldn't take it and they just kept closing down one by one. And um, the largest industry hit in Malaysia was actually the tourism industries with hotels and chains just all shutting down. Comparatively, um, the first world countries don't seem to be as in as bad of, of a situation as Malaysia. But here we ask a question about, um, do you think the government was handling the, the coronavirus well? In the, in the center, you will see Malaysia's um, results and in the outer ring is the world's average. Malaysia has shown a very strong support and they have a very strong belief in how the government has handled the situation as compared to how the world has um, you know, views their government in, in the handling of this. And it's very surprising when you see that 60% um, of Malaysians who claim to have lost a serious part of their income, yet we're looking at 90% support for the government. But on the opposite end, um, let's, let's take the US for example, 20% of the respondents say that, I mean, they claim that they have lost um, the income, but only 50% thinks the government's handling well. So I guess it's about perspective. 
you know, um, how it's so much serious here and how and so much worse here, and yet the support is there. One of the biggest factors we think that contribute to such a strong support from, from the Malaysians could be because of the government's allocation of uh, 280 billion ringgit, um, or approximately 65 billion US dollars in bursaries and other forms of financial aid to businesses and the people of Malaysia. And uh, bring a sense of relief to many of those who you know, are struggling to make ends meet. Moving on, um, some interesting findings that we found. Um, our results show that half of Malaysians think that the virus is exaggerated. And in fact, Southeast Asians share similar beliefs as well, with Indonesia showing 47% and Philippines showing 50% of um, who thinks the virus is exaggerated. On the ground, um, when you actually go out shopping and you go um, walking around, you visit shopping malls and eateries and you just see people spending their weekends out shopping, they're dining with their family in restaurants. To move on to some data, on the left, you will see Malaysia's data on how many respondents felt that the virus is exaggerated in the sense that they think it isn't as serious as what it's made out to be. But when we look to the right, there's, some, there's a little bit of contradiction going on here, right? So we asked the people if they were afraid that either they themselves or their family would catch the virus. And Southeast Asians are on the extreme ends with 80 and 90% saying they are afraid. Malaysians report 68% fear of catching the virus. So here's what we think. We feel that perhaps the people truly are afraid of catching the virus. They are afraid that their family might catch the virus. And why shouldn't they be? If they, if they were suspected of having caught the virus, they have to pay for the medical test themselves. They have to be hospitalized. They have to be quarantined for 14 days. What they aren't afraid of is death. Uh, interesting, oh, sorry. An interesting note here. This is the mortality rate of uh, Southeast Asians and some of the more extreme cases, the more unfortunate countries in the world. Um, this figures was actually extracted today um, as of 3rd of June. And uh, if you look at Malaysia's mortality rate, it's only standing at 1.4%. In fact, it's actually the lowest amongst the Southeast Asian countries, uh, the, amongst the four here. If you look to the right, you see countries like France, Italy, and UK, who are faced with mortality rates of 19 and 14%. And that's practically 10 to 13 times the difference of Malaysia. So why are, Malaysia, why are Malaysians afraid of catching the virus? It's because they're more afraid to, have to, to having to spend money and the inconvenience rather than the possibility of dying itself. That's, and that's something that is definitely interesting for us to conduct future research on. Moving on to a little, some lighter news. Um, Asians are actually quite optimistic about the future post COVID-19 and are prepared to sacrifice and change their way of life to prevent the virus from spreading further. This was a report that I took out from uh, McKinsey who did a survey across five Asian countries, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, and South Korea. And in fact, the Asians seem to be quite optimistic about the near future post COVID-19. In fact, they believe that their economy will recover to what it was or even better in just two to three months time. The outlier here is Japan, who shows quite a pessimistic view and are unsure about the situation. And instead they feel that it's going to have a long lasting impact or even fall into recession. Comparing with, oh, sorry. Yeah, comparing with some of the data that we have, we ask the respondents, are you willing to sacrifice some of your human rights to help uh, prevent the disease, the spread of the disease? And um, it's the general consensus, consensus of Asians to willingly sacrifice some of their human rights in order to curb the pandemic and bounce back from this crisis. Um, again, if you remember the slides from earlier, it's an almost mirror reflection to McKinsey's report with the exception that um, Japan is the outlier who is not willing to sacrifice their rights as humans in order to combat the virus. And from this graph alone, you can tell the general public mood is getting more serious about the situation revolving COVID-19. The fact that they are willing to sacrifice their human rights is strong proof on their perseverance and the will to fight. In fact, looking back from where I'm from, Malaysia, so uh, some of you may know or may not know is that Malaysians aren't exactly the most pessimistic or the most um, quiet kind of people. We're actually quite vocal about our rights. And um, we actually have a election called Bursay Rally, which is the fight for clean election. And one of the rallies actually held 300,000 protesters within Kuala Lumpur itself. We're generally not submissive and we don't give up our human rights that easily. Oops, sorry, next. Yeah. And um, putting the fears and darkness behind the world, or at least Malaysia, is hopeful of a better tomorrow. 
we expect life to be different from how we used to know it. And we believe that the world powers, because of this pandemic, will start to work together to help uh, one another in times of crisis. Malaysians are a lot hopeful than, uh, that the world powers will be more cooperative as compared to its Asian counterparts. And a great example of this is actually um, when you see China suffering in, at the start, you see a lot of countries um, sending their voices, sending support, sending care packages. And later on, when China improves, China themselves return the favors, helping the countries around them. We expect a new normal, a new way of life. Working from home is now the norm, and so is ordering takeout or having groceries delivered to your doorstep. Asians see a new world that's about to come. But in actual fact, the new normal isn't really a new way of life. But rather, COVID-19 is the acceleration of change in economic and social thinking. This is what crises tend to do. In the midst of pain and despair, they bring about new thinking and accelerates reform that makes the world we live in just a little bit better. The demand shift allows a better development of the digital industry, bringing us a world that's more digitalized and innovative. And this digitalization carries forward into our market research world. So the future of market research or public opinion polling is very likely to see a shift towards CATI over face-to-face -face interviews. People are fearful to speak upfront with strangers in this low-touch era. And in some countries, face-to-face -face data collection is going to be more difficult than others. What Central Force does to combat the effects of COVID-19 is that we persuade our clients to conduct their studies via CATI telephone interviews. In fact, we have already been conducting public opinion research polling via CATI for the past four years, and we have capabilities to create robust telephone frames for random digit dialing, and we use a proprietary filtering system to filter off for a more efficient frame and removing the non-working numbers from it, increasing the response rate, making interviewers' productivity rise. We do CATI for almost all of our work and to ensure that we instill confidence in our interviewers as well for their safety, we ensure that our CATI interviewers undergo a full body sanitization um, before they enter the CATI center and we sanitize our equipment and hardware three times daily. And for what is worth, the new normal is going to make us more adaptable, more efficient, more innovative and more opportunity, opportunistic. And we will abuse this opportunity to show, sorry, to show the world what market research is truly like and how important it is to understand the new normal. So that's it I have. Um, yes. Thank you guys for listening and feel free to contact me if you want to know more. Yeah, back to you, Yulia. Uh, thank you, Yu. Full border sanita sanitation sounds uh, scary, <laughs> <laughs> but impressive, but impressive. You still share on your screen if you could stop it. Uh, so yeah. Have I stopped? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, you, you need to you need to stop uh, sharing the screen on the bottom of your, of your screen. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, there we go. And thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, I see new questions appearing for 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 why you for Gary, and I thought that I, I saw one more for Constanza, and we have one more presentation. We go back in time to Sweden. It's about four p.m. in Sweden, and our next presenter is. Uh, Tornbjorn, uh, I'm sorry, Tornbjorn, I can't pronounce yeah. your, your second name, uh, yeah. but Tornbjorn is a uh, CEO of Novus Group, a full service research provider. They do qualitative and quantitative research and they have a probability based online panel. And I think Tornbjorn is going to present us some results from it. Uh, the floor is yours, Tornbjorn. Yes, thank you. Let's see, now I can share my screen. And my name is pronounced Torbjörn Sjöström. So my parents didn't want me to leave Sweden. That's one thing that's for sure. Let's see, is, is my presentation mode? No, it works. Yes. Thank you for having me and being the last presenter. Uh, we'll see if I, I don't have as nice slides as you <laughs> other guys have. But let, let's start with what we started researching and we, we have been focusing at, at more on the health status, actually more of a, a physiological health status. If you believe that you've got COVID-19, what symptoms you have, how long you've been sick, when you think you've been sick, if you changed your habits, but also if you follow the social distancing rules and if you're worried about getting COVID and how, how much you trust the government and uh, the view of your economic and health future. And, and maybe, maybe, you know, Sweden has been perceived as being very laid back to the entire COVID situation. We, we didn't have any hard, hard um, 
lockdowns. Um, the, the government trusted us to be able to have our own social distancing, and they also focused on, on, on uh, protecting the, the elder. Um, and this has been very look, looking for, from, from a Swedish perspective uh, at, at how it's been perceived in the world. It looks like we don't care at all, but we actually have been following and trying to do our best to keep our distance. Uh, but at the same time, for, for us as the research industry, it was almost a business as usual. We, we can do telephone polls and we also do online service. Um, but as I think all of you have had to do, we have to work much harder because a lot of industries had to stop and we had to work very hard to actually being able to survive. But it's been working. Physical focus groups has been hard, of course. We haven't done any of those, but uh, online focus groups are working very well. Um, but during this, we also had some time uh, to, to, to over and, and think about what we were going to do. And that's when, when we started this, our uh, corona status, as I call it, just trying to get a feel for, for the, the state of Sweden. And, and this is done uh, using online. Uh, we have uh, over 50,000 probability-based uh, randomly recruit recruited Swedes uh, as members. And we, we see this as our, our, our most valued uh, resource. So, so we do only, you only get one research a month and uh, the, the time for our, our polls or in general, the average time for our polls is five minutes. So we're doing everything to have a high quality, quality uh, panel. And on the 18th of March, it was uh, confirmed that we had a, a general spread in Sweden and we started this tracking. Oh, the general spread was a couple of days earlier, but we quickly started doing something. Uh, so far, we are a little, have done the 20, 25th of May, we have done 33,500 interviews. There's a couple of thousand more now. Uh, the age has been 18 and up to 89 year olds. Um, the majority being between 18 and 79 year olds. And it's, uh, this research has actually been the best qual uh, research we've ever done. More than 73% or, or sorry, 70, uh, at average 73% answer our polls, which is we've never been seen this high rate. And probably because it's uh, an important, important questions it's at a time where people are staying from home and they have their cell phone or the computer. About 60% answered our polls on, on, on cell phones, which is a little bit higher than we're used to, but we are a very highly mobilized country as well. So, so a lot of people answer by cell phone on, on average, uh, on a normal research as well. But w one thing that I think it's good to keep in mind that Swedes, are great at official statistics. Uh, it's, it's often our bane in official comparisons. For instance, in, in unemployment rate, we look at, like we have a much higher unemployment because we track everything. And I think that's the same with the casualties in, with COVID-19, uh, that we, we miss very few, even if you die at, at an elderly home, ha having other terminal diseases, you will be marked as a COVID-19 fatality and that that is something to have in mind when you look at, at the death rates comparing different countries because i know that we are marking everyone we can um, but on the other hand one thing i've been do, talking about with with uh, national health Ser services is that we're not doing clinical tests we're, we're not trying to get a um, being able to to estimate the, the number of population uh, Swedes actually being infected with COVID-19 uh, using any antibody tests or similar. And that is a big mystery and I hope they will start doing this soon because we really need to have that. Um, and looking at our, our most interesting find is, findings is for, for starters, the Swedes com, com, comply with their recommendations. We, we keep our social distance. Oh, sorry, sorry, I think I no, I didn't miss one. Maybe it's the next slide. Um, 
the COVID-19 actually increased trust in society. Uh, we have seen uh, before this, we, we saw uh, the Swedish Democrats growing quite rapidly, which being a populist uh, reaction against the government and the stability of, of, of Sweden. But, but this has been changed. This has changed. And during the, the, this pandemic, uh, we all actually see that people start trusting the society each other and, and the government in a way we've never seen before. Uh, our uh, research, which is a self-assessment, I will show you a little bit more later, is still the best tool we have to actually being able to estimate the, the spread in Sweden. Uh, we saw on the 14th of April, we actually saw that 50,000 Swedes from our research uh, probably got infected in December and January, long before um, this was officially known in Sweden. And uh, we also see that from, from France and, and UK uh, research in May that the infection has been in, in Europe in December and January. So, so it's, it's, we actually could see that before it actually was uh, official. Um, one thing that's been scaring me the most is that a lot of uh, probable COVID uh, infected have been sick for a very, very long time, more than 10 weeks, which is, uh, which has been worrying me a lot, but there's good news coming <laughs> in the following slides. Um, first, 70% of the people living in Stockholm, which has been uh, perceived as the, the, the big being hit worst from, from COVID-19, actually keep their so social distancing. Half of the people working in Stockholm work from home. Uh, and uh, so, so, so we, we see that people actually do what they can 60% of Sweden in total keep their distance. Uh, this is a timeline. So, so 0519 is uh, 19th of May. Um, we're not that worried about getting coronavirus. Um, maybe if, if you compare to, to Malaysia, we, we all have free health care. So we're not that worried about uh, have, having uh, medical costs and things. It's only... 5% that are very worried. Um, there's much, it's a majority of not, not being worried uh, to that big extent. Uh, but this is, this is the first thing that, 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 that I found was really interesting when, because you're not used to doing health studies from, from, uh, from a perceived, your own self-assessment, but we, we thought that this would be a good thing to do. And uh, the, the, Orange uh, line is Stockholm, that's the capital of Sweden. And looking at the 24th of May, 26% of people living in Stockholm think they have been effect, infected with, with coronavirus. And in total, Sweden, 15%. And why do I believe this? Because it, it is a little bit controversial, but uh, in in there have been a small anti antibody test that was done in Sweden in looking at uh, the uh, uh, probability-based sample uh, looking at Stockholm. And in the beginning of April, that test con uh, concluded that 10% of, of people living in Stockholm had, been, uh, had antibodies for the coronavirus. And at the same time, we saw that we had 9% uh, in Stockholm, because we are we've been tracking this all the time, so we could actually see uh, that this this was making sense. So it's very probable that that self-assessment is a reliable way to actually get a grasp of of, of how much spread we have. Um, and this I'll just skip over because I'm talking too slow. Uh, Six percent think they have been affected in December. Seventy-seven percent in January. Um, for to, a couple of weeks ago, 340,000 Swedes have been sick of the same disease for more than 10 weeks. But the good news is that this week, this has, half, this has gone down to half. So now it's only 150,000 Swedes that have been sick for more than 10 weeks. So I think we're, we're seeing some, some good news now when we see this disease uh, going away. Um, we saw an increase, trust increase in the government and politics, but we also today released that this trust has been 
declining rapidly. Uh, if you were want to know more about that, you can ask me by email because this is in the news today. We're presenting this. Um, uh, the biggest takeaway, I think, is that we could see a lot of things that then were con con concluded in uh, official statistics, in travel patterns, uh, when we got sick, uh, how many that were sick. Um, and we also see that there should be more uh, official research doing, uh, looking at the health status of, of the public because that is not being done and I think that has to be done. If, if, we, if someone would have done what we, we had done now with, with asking how you feel and your health status, you could actually get early indicators of a future pandemic, uh, which I think we really need to have to think about in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tom Bjorn. Let's uh, see if I can stop the uh, sharing. Yes. I, I lost uh, the view. A very, 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 very unusual approach and very interesting presentation and perfect yeah, time. Yes, to... sorry. Sorry for and my Swedish, you. my English not being that thank good, you. but <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's a world organization, and uh, for, I don't think that there are many of us for whom English is a native language, so it's not a problem. And thank you for all the participants who who did these presentations. That's really indeed a big variety of approaches. I see that there is a number of questions for for you, colleagues, uh, and I'll read some of them. And also, I want to invite all of our listeners, all of our attendees, to post questions either on questions and answers or on the chat, so I could I could read them. And also, there is a feature: raise your hand. Uh, you you can see it on the bottom panel. If you raise your hand, I can give you a floor, and you can have a commentary. You can you can say something. You can add something. Okay, so for Torm uh, we have two questions. How do you recruit your panel and do you provide uh, honorarium or token to your online panel recruits? Uh, yeah, for we, Constanza, no, just, uh, I just, uh, oh, if sorry. you yeah. let me read all the questions. For mm -hmm. Constanza, uh, I see two questions not answered. One is, uh, is there any difference uh, in perception of COVID between men and women? And uh, the other question was about how COVID influenced solidarity because you wrote the book of, of solidarity in Argentina. Uh, so these are questions for you. And I see that Gary have already answered, uh, has already answered questions about Sean archive, but if uh, other questions appear or if, if Gary wants to answer them in, in a voice, uh, welcome. And why you also has answered his questions. So first I suggest Thornbjorn, then Constanza, and then uh, new questions uh, which come in or new commentaries that which come in? Uh, yeah, we we recruit uh, mainly using telephone. The, the, we, we have a, um, uh, we, 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 we draw a, a random sample of all the individuals living in Sweden. And uh, if you're selected, you, we will contact you primarily via, via telephone. But if you don't have a telephone number, we will actually send you a postcard. So, so we are, it's, uh, it's going uh, probably a little based as far, far as it's uh, possible. Uh, and I'm not really sure what, what it means with honorary or, or, or token. I don't really understand. Did you, did you, did, what do you pay your participants for joining? Oh, no, we, we basically don't pay them anything. <laughs> for the COVID-19 study, we haven't, uh, we don't give them anything. They are, they are answering uh, completely uh, from their own will. You will, if you answer for one year, you actually, you could get a, a, a paperback book. That's basically the amount of <laughs> money you get uh, for, 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 from, from being a member of our panel. And, and, I see, and I see one more question for you, uh, for Sweden. Why, why there will be a rapid decline in trust in government after COVID-19? Yeah, yeah, actually we, 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 we saw this today. We, we, we saw a, a rapid decline and uh, I think the, the reason for that is you, you, you could accept a couple of months in, in an in a extreme situation where we're just happy to survive and not having being, being uh, hit that bad with, 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 uh, with the virus. But now we're going into a new situation that we're trying to understand why the mortality rate is higher than, for instance, Norway. Uh, are we allowed to travel during summer? There, there are completely different set of questions now that 
is not in an emergency state or, or it's more like we're trying to understand, okay, what's happening now? Where are we? How much is left? Uh, which are completely it. different type of, of uh, government that's uh, needed. Someone, yeah. someone ask in chat, Tron Bjorn, to share your email address if, if you want to do so. And also, uh, yeah. I invite I've... all participants to, to take a look at the questions. And now, Constanza, I'll, I'm, I'm unmuting you to answer your questions. Um, yes. Um, regarding the question about men and women, it is interesting to say that uh, there are no major differences. What we found when we uh, have conducted research about COVID is that in general, like the numbers uh, are quite stable in all uh, sociodemographic strata. That doesn't mean that there aren't differences, but that the big numbers are like quite the same. Having said this, it is interesting to note that women tend to be more afraid than men, and that also women tend to comply with all the hygiene and prevention habits more. At least they declare that they wash their hands more, use the mask more, and they are willing uh, to uh, um, give up more rights than men. At the same time, when we ask respondents to assess their compliance with what the government is requesting in terms of lockdown and uh, um, uh, hygiene habits, they tend to be stricter on themselves. They are better people, I would say. And regarding the question uh, about solidarity, that is a very interesting question. Of course, we would love to conduct a study specifically on that, on how COVID influences volunteer work and donations. We have not conducted such study, but what we are seeing is that people have a, a, a refreshed their sense of community in the neighborhoods. If there is someone in the building who needs something, people are, people are active and attentive. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in some places, pe people have turned very vigilant. So we watch the neighbor, not just to see if they need anything or if they, there is anything that you can do, but also to make sure that they're complying with the lockdown and, and such. So I think it's quite complex and we need to research more in order to understand it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I see. I see a new question for why you uh, did you use only mobile sample or mobile RDG or did you also employ the landline? And if so, how did you do that? Hi. Um, so we only use mobile only. Um, the reason being is because the landline penetration in Malaysia is extremely low. Um, I believe it's thirteen percent, which is the latest uh, statistics. So it's very difficult to penetrate into the landlines. Um, and furthermore, because we do it via random digit dialing. So when the interviewers call um, call through landline numbers, they tend to also get uh, sorry they also tend to get broadband lines and uh, inactive lines and voicemails as well. So it makes it very difficult to conduct uh, catty vibe with uh, landline frame. So we do it exclusively through mobile only. Uh, great. I'm looking at 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 at. at, at other questions, I don't see anything which was not answered. And I see one participant with a raised hand. Uh, I am turning him on. Uh, Syed, did you want to give a commentary? Uh, I'm trying to un unmute and un un unmute him. There are always interesting technicalities. Uh, I'm sorry, Syed, I cannot un unmute you. Uh, there is another person who raised a hand, uh, Maria Kruchok. I'm trying to unmute her as well. Uh, okay. For uh, some reason. Yulia, ask them to unmute themselves. Uh, Syed and Maria, uh, if you can unmute yourselves because I cannot do so, you can give your commentaries. The button unmute is on the bottom left panel. 
on the bottom panel on on the left side uh, uh, our technical support uh, which is Renee says that she's not sure that people can join with commentaries if they're not panelists then we've been misunderstanding this technology colleague colleagues I apologize for it uh, I, I think I, I, I think we we ran out of questions I see thanks Oh, there was one more question for Turnbjorn. How could you strengthen social trust while the same society tried to stop your mobility? Turnbjorn, yeah. it's for you. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not really sure how to... I think what happened is that people thought that the, the Sweden would collapse at the smallest catastrophe and and what what happened now is that everything more or less turned, uh, worked as as normal except that we were asked to stay at home as much as possible and that increased the trust in the society and and also in the government and and uh, and, and um, the society as a whole uh, so so I, I think we actually started we trusted the, each other more than we actually trusted the politicians before that <laughs> we realized that people actually are decent people <laughs> More or less. I'm not sure if that's really the answer to your question, but, that's, but I think it's best I can give. <laughs> uh, well, uh, at least you tried. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, again. Any closing remarks, any closing comments from any of our speakers? Uh, Gary, why you? Um, nothing, not, nothing too much, but um, I just like to say that I think the COVID-19 is a very great chance for all of us as uh, market research or, pool or posters to come up with new ideas, new innovations and make the market research or the polling world a lot more efficient, a lot more innovative. So I, I urge everyone else to take this chance to abuse the system. Yeah. <laughs> great. And for me, uh, Nothing further. Just just wanted to say thanks. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If uh, you're interested as data producers in in uh, contributing uh, probability-based surveys to the Sean Archive, please just send word to me, uh, G Langer at LangerResearch.com, and I'd love to explore that with you. All contributions of that nature are very welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Gary, Constanza, Turnbull. No, I think I've talked enough. <laughs> it was a very interesting panel. Thanks for thanks for the invitation. Um, it is very interesting to see that although this is um, a phenomenon that is global, the, the sickness, uh, there are some different, very interesting differences in how a country a governments react and how the society feels. And it's very important that, that we conduct research in our own regions and countries, but that we also have these spaces to share international findings. So thanks for that, Wafer. Um, thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, everyone, who joined uh, us. Wait uh, a minute. Question, if will you answer, uh, issue the certificate to the participants? No. And there is a, a message from, from Claire Durand here, uh, which is the next uh, webinar will be uh, beginning of July. I think it's uh, Thursday. July 9th. 9th? Yes. And it will be about mixed mode surveys and it will be given by uh, presented by Edith Deleu and Anne Elevelt from uh, the Netherlands. Great. And the recording of this webinar, as well as all the presentations, are going to be published on the Vapor website. So look, look, watch your email for notification. And Thanks you will have a knowledge. survey. And you will have a post-webinar survey. Fantastic. So we're closing. Thanks again. Thank you for who, who is writing us. Thank you, Xavier. Great to see you. And thank you, Blunt. And thank you for everyone who's writing.
Thanks to you. Bye. Shall we? Shall we? Shall we? I'm trying to. Shall we take a picture for a, of of every participant? You can. You can have a um, uh, screenshot. Screenshot. Yeah. I'm not. I will uh, get out of oh, there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Renee, would you would you appear? Claire, would you appear back? Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I shouldn't have here. I'm not a participant. Uh, come on, you're 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 a hidden hidden cardinal. Yeah. Now everyone smiles and and, and uh, I press print screen. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, colleagues. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day.